We need to get control of our own destiny. Spread out the risk and diversify. Because there's no margin in this business. Treat the customers well. Two people running four stores and there's usually no silver bullet. This is going to be uh, survival of the fittest. Hey everyone, Dave Menz, Laundromat Millionaire here in Cincinnati, Ohio with my beautiful wife, Carla. And we are excited to be back for another episode of Laundromat Millionaire Business Podcast. We some, we've got some fantastic guests today and we're going to be talking uh, kind of the sister industry to the laundromat industry, which is the dry cleaning business. So I know a lot of you do wholesale dry cleaning. A lot of our um, audience probably does dry cleaning themselves. And so this may interest you a little bit more. Um, if you're in the laundromat industry and you've always considering doing some type of drop dry cleaning in your store or something like this, they, this may be the show for you. But the beauty of this is we're going to talk to our guests today who are just fantastic small business owners who have built an incredible team um, here in Cincinnati near us. Um, and uh, so we're going to be talking to them just about business. So even if you're not in the dry cleaning and laundromat industry, uh, we're going to have some great life lessons for you on how to build a great team and a great business and how to overcome adversity. So that's kind of the plan for today's show. We hope you guys are ready for it. How are you doing today? I am great. And I am really excited today, Dave, to have our guests with us uh, to tell you a little bit about our guests. So today we have with us Rich and Teresa Redmond. Rich and Teresa are the owners and operators of Your Cleaners based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Along with their amazing team, they operate four dry cleaning locations as well as offering home pickup and delivery. Having worked a good portion of their careers in corporate America, their background was not in dry cleaning. Teresa spent about 35 years with Kroger, starting in stores and working at the corporate offices before leaving to run their business operations full time. Rich remains employed in the broadcast and media industry, working for companies that provide infrastructure to radio and TV stations. So they have a wonderful business in dry cleaning here in Cincinnati. We use them in our stores as well. And we are so happy to have you all today. Welcome, Rich and Teresa. Thanks for being on here with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So why the the dry cleaning industry? You all didn't start out in this. How long have you been in the dry cleaning industry now? And why? Why did you get into it? Oh, what, five or six years? Uh, it's six and a half years. And Two days and five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're counting. <laughs> yeah, Teresa's got one of those little clocks that yes. just keeps going. Yes. Right. So I'm going to jump in and guess that you guys just, both of you always dreamed of owning a dry cleaning plant. Um, you always dreamed of spending your summers in a very comfortable work environment. And Ever since I was a you, little girl. Yeah, eventually you got that, you know, you, you were able to capture that dream. Is that what happened? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I wanted to retire. And Rich said, well, you're not going to sit at home. And that's how it happened. There you well, go. You're not sitting at home. <laughs> you're not sitting yeah. at home. And here I am. So are you working even more now than you did before you retired? <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, it depends upon what's going on, you know. It has some ups and downs. Yeah, right? it has its ups and downs. Sometimes I'm, you know less than more. And so since COVID, um, I took on the route. So, and I just have not stopped that. So, um, which is only several days a week, but then there's the back end of putting it all together and, um, which it's fine. It's, it's been nice to see that half of it and get more engaged with those customers versus where they maybe weren't as engaged with the driver before. So, um, I think that's been a good thing. Right. So, so going yeah. back to when you first decided, okay, I'm retiring from Kroger and I need another job, something to do, keep me busy, keep my husband happy here. Um, <laughs> why dry cleaning? Did you just see a good opportunity? Did you look at other opportunities? Yeah, I think, you know, part of what we looked at was, um, you know, we, we were trying to find something that was not... Um, we didn't want food industry. Yeah, we didn't want to get in the food industry. We also didn't want something where, you know, it was easily replaced with sourcing stuff from China, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of, you know, selling, having a little widget store and, and selling things that you could easily buy online. So we wanted to look at something that was a local service business mm -hmm. and that, you know, had enough scale. And, uh, you know, we kind of came across the first part of the business we got involved in through a you know, it was for sale. We bought a, a, a business that was ongoing and, 
and that's kind of where we got started and and then we just kind of started diversifying from there so it it was really more we knew we didn't want to i guess fight amazon or ebay and um <laughs> Yeah, they and don't do dry cleaning yet, right? No, they Amazon don't. Not, not yet. yet. <laughs> not, not, not yet. Not yet. Uh, they do. They do a lot of things, but but yeah, that was probably the biggest thing, you know. And I think Teresa, coming from retail, had you know a lot of understanding of what went on there, and you know how tough it can be to go up against some you know some of these guys that just have tremendous scale, like a Walmart or a, a Kroger or someone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when you all started, Teresa, when you got to the point where you were ready to retire, was it an automatic transition where you guys were just like, okay, like we're going to, we're going to buy a small business. We found the business first and then um, it was at the end of 2014. So it would have been the beginning of 15. Um, so we wanted to do end of year because um, then, you know, the way vacations roll and everything like that. Um, so, and it just worked out that what we were interested in, cause I think we started our process on purchasing maybe in September or October, yeah, probably. Um, so it took that much time. Um, so kind of, you know, switching gears into thinking in a different mode. I thought I'd have a little bit of time in between one job to the other. So customer service was not an obstacle or an issue or a factor because I was so used to that, but it was just been learning that process. And interestingly enough, I was, I was surprised by how very simple it is. You know, I, I would always have a joke. I could say, you got your soap, you got your water, you got your hanger and your poly and you're good, you know, <laughs> kiddingly. Right. But, um, uh, you know, so basically I had training with someone um, the previous owner for about okay. a week and then kind of uh, it, that was it. So I really had no time in between one job to the other. Um, so it was just picking up and going, um, you know, and you're of course learning things as you, you go also, but um, yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't a big transition time there. It was <laughs> off and running. So, um, and, and, you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit before is, um, you know, surrounding yourself with good people. And there was a lot of good people in the business, in, in this company um, there already. So we had a good basis to start with. Did you keep a lot of the employees when you purchased the business? Did you keep, yeah, were you able to every, keep a lot of the existing employees? Yeah, every one of them. And nice. Richard said something before, and there's people who come to us and want to talk to us about, oh, we're thinking about doing this or starting this. And I'm always like, boy, the one thing Rich ta taught me was, you know, why do, you, why do you really want to hang a shingle outside? Just, you know, acquire an existing business. Then from day one, you have somebody walking in the door, you know, and there's, there's in this business, there are people out there who want to sell, you know, they're getting out of the business. It's kind of an, a generational thing. It's like they've, yeah. they've moved on. Their kids don't want it um, to get into that business. But um, yeah, I, I think that that's been a good, good thing, you know? So what you're buying is, customers, not really yeah. their press, their, their store, their, you know, it's really the customers. Right? Yeah. That's, you know, I think most people are creatures of habit and sure. so they're relatively happy with the place they're going and it's convenient. You know, it's hard to get them to switch. Right. So yeah. we, we found um, to Teresa's point, you know, we started with one location that did mostly wholesale uh, business and then, you know, we added another location that wasn't very far away that we acquired from someone else. And then we did that a couple more times and, and, you know, built and grew. And it was really all about um, getting more customers mm -hmm. because, you know, somebody to get them to change from what they're doing and in the dry cleaning space, you know, people wear less formal clothes. So the number of suits and dresses is, is reducing right? So you kind of have an overabundance of, of dry cleaners. So to get those customers to go someplace else, you either got to hope the other guys mess up really bad or, you know, go out of business or have a fire or, you know, you, you, you know, you acquire the customer base and then, you know, treat the customers well and, and try to give them a lot of value for, uh, you know, what you're delivering and, and take care of them. And then they stick around. Yeah. So when you guys acquired this um, location, your first location, which had an amazing team, I mean, would you describe that as kind of a turnkey business or did you go in and make 
drastic. It sounds like you had good people, but that doesn't necessarily mean you had good processes. Did you go in and change a lot of things? And I know you were trial by fire, so I'm guessing you didn't change things quickly. But over time, I don't, I don't know how a year or two. Did you, did you kind of work your way into the business, learn the industry? I'm guessing you got some great advice from somewhere along the way and start to transition the business into your own? Or do you still pretty much run it the way that it was? You just purchased a fantastic asset. Yeah, you, there are some things, of course, that stayed in place. But I remember my first few weeks there because we really were, I mean, it was probably 5%, you know, through the front door and 95% okay. wholesale. It was drastic, very drastic from where we are today. And I just remember the first couple of weeks I'm, I'm watching because they had a whole tagging area because our wholesale people, they didn't check customers in. We actually put them into our system. We took their tickets and then ticketed the close. We did everything from start to finish. And I was like, wow, you ticket. And as you know, a lot of repeat customers, you know, Bob Jones comes in every single week. And I was just really blown away by the fact that they tagged shirts every single time and versus where at that time the industry was going there um, with the permanent tagging. And so that was the first thing that I was on is like, and they were like, yep, this way we do it this way. You got to do it. And they, they couldn't figure it out before we got there. We got that figured out probably within the first six months. Definitely. And we started in on that. And that saved a huge amount of time. I mean, sure. because the shirts would come in, if a customer had 15 shirts, you might tag one every three months because they get a new shirt or, you know, one that they finally hadn't worn for the year. But I mean, we were, we went from tagging thousands of shirts a day to, I kid you not, um, to maybe 30 or 20, you know, it was substantial. So that was probably the biggest change we made. And then over time, we've just, you know, we always thought the setup in the plant was really good. And that the layout stayed um, until recently when we, you know, added our dry cleaning to that location. Um, but there was a lot of good things in place. But that was the one thing where it's like, this has got to change now. <laughs> so, so it was, it was very obvious. What, what is, per, what do you mean by permanent tagging? I don't. Like, do you actually like put something permanently on their clothes? Yeah. So it's on the inside of a shirt. Like a heat seal. It's, oh. a, it's a little heat seal kind of adhesive uh, uh, a piece on the, so that you, in that case, you didn't need to redo it every time. And yeah. So, I didn't even realize that you do that. And you all have like dry clean stuff for us. I didn't even realize <laughs> there was well, a permanent and, tag and on we there. We don't. We don't to dry. It, it was all about shirts because that's okay. the business we were in. But um, also like men's shirts, like, um, Tide puts a, a scan bar, a permanent scan bar on everything versus a blouse, yeah. pants, everything. We only do men's shirts uh, okay. to wholesale. Yeah, to yeah. wholesale. So, so I think probably, you know, tr one of the things, you know, building on what Teresa said is, um, you know, we probably looked around where you could see efficiencies with a, you know, fresh set of eyes. Yeah. And probably the other thing from a fresh set of eyes is, you know, not coming from the business, we are always kind of bewildered as to how so many places that are supposed to clean clothes were so dirty. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so for us, you know, I think the, the thing we did get on pretty quickly was like, you know, somehow people seem to think mysteriously broken equipment's going to repair itself if you leave it piled up in the corner. Right. So, I think, you know, Teresa got the scrapper to come and we hauled away, you know, a bunch of stuff and, you know, painting and cleaning and, you know, making customers feel like they're coming to, you know, a place that they're, you can kind of be proud to go in, right? Sure. If, if, if you walk into a lobby full of leaves and the place is dirty, you kind of got to scratch your head going, I don't know how they're going to get my clothes clean or what ha what happens to my clothes behind the wall. Yeah. Right. right. You know, and, and I think, you know, I've been to your place as well. And it's oh. like, it's unlike any other, you know, uh, laundry mat that I've been to, right? Oh, yeah. It's, it's just Thank very you. different. We try. <laughs> you know. but we have the same philosophy. People need to feel when they walk in that door, one, they need to feel welcome, but they also need to feel if they're going to clean their stuff, it needs to be a clean place yeah. or else they don't want to clean their stuff there. Exactly. Right. You know, so I, I, I think that, you know, and, and then as we kind of grew, you know, I will say that every uh, place that we added, 
you know, we learned something. Every operator did something mm-hmm. that had, you know, there were some things that didn't make sense to us, but we learned in every single case and then kind of incorporated. So I think yeah, probably one of the things we've been pretty good at is trying to have an open mind and go, okay, what's working? If it's working, how can I adopt it and use it elsewhere? And then if there are things that aren't working, try to quickly change it. You went into what is a very labor intensive business, at least from my perspective, I, I'm, I can't yeah. imagine it's not. And you yeah. went in and said, okay, where can we improve processes? And the taggy, the heat seal tagging, I don't know if I use the terminology correctly. That was something that was a pretty drastic change. Do you remember just as like a percentage, how much that saved on labor or was it, was it monumental? Uh, yeah, I would even say it's more than that. 20, 25% at the time. So in I, a business. I, yeah. Yeah. So in a business that is labor intensive, meaning that your labor should have probably, when you bought the business, labor was a pretty good chunk of your, oh, your expenses. Oh, yeah, it's and mostly. And you were able to cut that by roughly a, a fourth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With a mindset of, you went into the business as newbies, right? You didn't know anything. You didn't grow up in the business. It's not like you decided to get back into it. And you said, like, that was kind of a benefit to you, right? Because you were going in with eyes wide open. You didn't have preconceived notions of, well, we always did it this way, so we have to always do it this way. You were the yeah, opposite. Exactly. And you were like, well, why do we do it this way? This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. you did something that made a drastic change in the business model. And then obviously the cleanliness, that doesn't exactly seem like, you know, an epiphany type of thing. But as we know, for <laughs> I, a lot of people, it is. For, for some we, people, it is. <laughs> and we learned that too. And I would imagine that that made a pretty drastic change probably over time in the walk-in business. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, maybe to kind of build on that a bit, Dave. You know, when we got into the business, as Teresa was saying, our first location was mostly wholesale. We did shirts for a lot of other people and we had a small front door. And, you know, as we looked at it, you know, so the good news was you could do the same thing and get really efficient at it because you're doing the same thing every day over and over again. The bad news is, you know, when most of your business is wholesale, you only have a handful of customers, right? They bring you a whole bunch of stuff. Right. But, you know, if one of them goes away for some reason, it's a big chunk of your business. Sure. So our, our growth into adding these other storefronts was to more spread out the risk and diversify so that, you know, you've got, I don't know, a couple thousand customers at a store that are fairly regular. Right. So if one of them, you know, moves out of town or, you know, retires or some reason they don't need dry cleaning anymore, it's not like a third of your business is impacted. It's, it's one customer, right? Yeah. And that's so really, that diversification that's is a big deal for us and why we kept the, the other thing was we wanted to, you know, as Teresa said, getting closer to the customers, which I think in COVID, it wasn't exactly the, the plan to go do that, yeah. but, but we ended up getting closer as we kind of did more things ourselves, certainly Teresa more than me. Um, but the closer you get to the customer, then you learn a lot of things. You know, what do they really want? You kind of ingratiate yourself to them. Uh, I don't know. I, I think we have more dog cookies in the van now. Uh, right? <laughs> and, and, and we'll have the conversation. We, we, we know, who, you know, I, I get to see Lucky on Friday sometimes. It's this big <laughs> dog that one of our customers has. But, you know, you get closer to the customer and then, you know, you build a relationship and your business grows. And, uh you know, that's how we get referrals. Yep. You because get that customer people feel loyalty. Good. They yeah, a loyal exactly. customer to you. They tell other people how great you are. That word yeah, of exactly. Mouth. Yeah, I but that, that was probably our first whoops was in year one. We we're like, wow, this, our main customer was just dropping drastically. So we have no control over how he runs his business or sure. she runs her business um, and, and how you're, volume is flowing is like we thought right away we need to get control of our own destiny so that's really where we kind of took off and started and then it's kind of one of these things where who really wants to go into this business so um then a lot of people are calling us hey we want to sell hey so um so that was one that was one of the things i was going to ask you and i think you just answered it but i want to clarify so you got into the business and you realized this was a primarily wholesale business did you when you were going through that due diligence process, did you see like, oh, this is a problem, like having all this wholesale business? I did not see it in the beginning. It was after we started seeing a decline and we thought, uh-oh, uh-huh. you know, and because of where Mount Carmel is located, it's not like it's a high volume 
traffic area. So no matter what we did, cleaning the front end or whatever, um, painting, um, getting a brighter sign, whatever, those things weren't going to be the draw. We needed to, you know, get more visual front ends. You know, we needed to get more traffic. So, so as that started to happen, it was kind of an aha moment, like, exactly, mm, we need to diversify. Exactly. Yeah, because I mean, you know, when we went through the acquisition process, you do the due diligence and you look at the financials and, you know, the business generally had, it had some nice upticks and it, it had, you know, constant uh, revenue. It was just what was not so obvious was the concentration of customers. And then, you know, as Teresa said, the the decline from some of the, you know, key customers, right? So, you know, I think we figured that out pretty quickly and that, you know, kind of got us more focused on diversification mm-hmm. and, and having, you know, different kinds of customers. Plus, you know, frankly, um, you, you know, the rate you charge more uh, to the sure. end customer. Now you got more cost around it too, but, um, but the thing I think we've been able to take advantage of is, as we added locations, we never really added production capacity. So we built everything around kind of our core operating plant and it allowed us to leverage that. So, you know, when we add more home delivery customers, um, you know, or we have, you know, we consolidated a competitor into, into one of our locations, uh, you know, we didn't, we maybe added some more hours for people but we didn't need a new plant or new investment in equipment and stuff. We were able to scale that. So, so that's kind of been, you know, probably been beneficial for us. So you saw that excess capacity and was like, we need to tap into that and and get our margins up. Absolutely. I mean, that's the one thing, you know, if you, if you go to a lot of dry cleaning plants, it's amazing how few hours a day they actually operate. Mm -hmm. Because especially if somebody is a standalone store and they do all their production themselves, you know, unless for some reason they're a super high volume store, they may only do production for a couple hours a day. Wow. And the thing okay. that always struck me was they always think it's great. Oh, we started at six and we were done by nine thirty. And I'm kind of like going, well, there's 24 hours in a day. And so you've got this investment in your plant and it's sat idle for most of the day. So, you know, I think we saw that from the wholesale business, you know, when, when that business is super busy, it wouldn't be uncommon to have 12 hour days of just doing shirts all day. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right. You right. Know? And, and so you really got a different perspective as to how do you utilize your investment in capital equipment? Yeah. What percent of your business would you say is wholesale now? I know. So you started at about 95 was wholesale. What percent is that now? Yeah. So, um, and, and the, the good news about wholesale is while it has trickled off and really that some people have like zero come back after COVID. So people either call to have a wholesale business, um, have someone else do their business for them if they a own no equipment at all, or B um, something's broken and they're like, I'm not going to invest in it. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to pay somebody else to do it or see, they don't have the employees to do it and they don't want to mess around with it anymore. You know, so it's, it's yeah. one of those. Um, Cause we do have somebody who, you know, just owns a truck. They have a truck and they have customers. And so yeah. they don't own any equipment or, you know, so. Um, so they're really yeah. just a delivery service, not right. a dry cleaning service. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's kind of nice. So, but today it's probably what, under 20% of the business. Oh yeah. Yeah. Under 20% is wholesale. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. So it's That's a combination a of, yeah. yeah, it's a combination of we added. And um, it wasn't that before COVID. Like yeah. I said, some people have not come back. They don't need anything done. They're some of your wholesalers volume. haven't come back. You've, correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Because their, their volume so low, they don't have a quote overflow. Right. Mm. Or, or, you know, some of them closed, right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you yeah. know. There's a number, uh, there's, you know, less dry cleaning stores today than there were five years ago. Right. Right. So I think in our case, you know, so we, we said we have four locations, we'd had five and we consolidated one. And then one of the locations we bought our competitor who was literally 500 feet away. So we consolidated those stores. So, so part of the reason it got smaller was we really got focused on, as I said before, diversifying and adding more customers. And we grew our home delivery service, mm-hmm. which had been very small. Uh, it, well, it was non-existent originally. And then to Teresa's point, some of the wholesale stuff has shrunk. So we I wouldn't say it's a, a total flip, yeah. 
but it's maybe 10% of the business today. Yeah, but 15. Maybe, yeah. 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 So it's a much smaller piece of the business. So most of what we do is, um, is for ourselves. But I think probably because we started in the wholesale world, we probably have more of a mindset for that than your average dry cleaner who's never done it. Right. right? So that's why it's, it's second nature to us to have processes and be open to those things where, where other guys, it's maybe, you know, it's not the right fit for them, I guess. Right. Yeah. And, and there's um, less people out there doing it in the beginning. We were thinking, Oh, wow. You know, who's our competition. And, um, and there were other people out there doing wholesale and, then it kind of swung the other way and everybody's like, no, I don't want to, because I've had people call me. I'm going, have you called so-and-so? And so, I mean, they're <laughs> way across town and they're like, yep, I called everybody. Nobody's doing it anymore. So I'm like, okay. Less competition. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, not trying to give up the business, but I'm like going, this really isn't logistically, you know, right. feasible. a good thing <laughs> of how much time we're trancing back and forth. So I think probably being flexible about that's been, you know, that, that wouldn't you say that kind of being open, be flexible mm -hmm. has allowed us to kind of. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take on anything. Yeah. So can you walk us through the process of how you grew your business? And this is pre-COVID. So you purchased a store and I think you said roughly 2014. You improved the processes there, cleaned it up. Um, started to see some need for diversification. And then I, I know you now have four locations and you mentioned five at one point and merging one together. Can you walk us through the process yeah, of how sure. you looked at those opportunities? And I'm guessing you saw some and turned them down, said that's not the right yeah. opportunity and those types of things. Well, I think so, you know, uh, probably in, in uh, 15 was the first one we did. So we were in it not quite a year, I think, and we started looking. And there was uh, an operator who had a plant and a drop store. The drop store was closest to us. And, you know, so we went and looked at it and, you know, 90% of his volume was actually at the drop store. And so, you know, we said, okay, this is what we're interested in. We, we did a pretty hard scrub on the financials. I mean, that's probably the one thing that with the background we have, you know, and what we've done, we're probably fairly financially savvy. So you know, to the point where I, you know, had one of the owners we bought from said, you know, this is kind of tiring. I feel like you continually ask me a lot of financial questions. And, you know, he kept wanting to tell me about promotions in his equipment. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. But if it doesn't make any money, I mean, this isn't a hobby, mm -hmm. right? You know, a boat's a hobby. You can go throw yeah. a lot of money at a boat. Right. Uh, so, you know, we did the one drop store. Well, the guy closed his plant and he, you know, we didn't pay for that equipment. Uh, and we went in and cleaned it up and rebranded it, you know, added it to our website and did that kind of stuff. And that, that location worked quite well for us. It, it, and it was less than two miles from our plant. So logistically, it was very easy. Mm -hmm. And it had, uh, you know, a, a, a goodly amount of commercial business. Uh, probably a year later, um, ironically, the dry cleaner I used to go to before we got in the dry cleaning business you know, I got to know the owner a bit and we've been having conversations about maybe doing some work for him. And he was, he was going to uh, have to close his business or sell it. And so what we, uh, he had several locations, what we ended up doing was acquiring um, one location that was logistically close to us. So that was in the Loveland area. That was a drop store. Uh, and that's what got us introduced to the home delivery because he had a very small home delivery route. And we said, well, this is interesting. And so what we did is we went to the other stores that were going to close that we weren't acquiring. And we worked with him and his staff to convert the best customers to home delivery since those stores were closing. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of gave us this, I guess, sticking our toe in the water on home delivery. We, we didn't exactly know what we were doing, but we knew it was a trend that was important. Yeah. And, you know, frankly, in that case, you know, we he had some financial issues. And so, you know, we paid very little to get that business. And so that was, was quite good. Um, then maybe a year later, we added the Milford location. Now this actually was probably, I would say the best run business that we, that we bought. It was the opposite of most places. The guy had been in it his whole, he grew up in the business. 
You'd owned this one for a long time. The place was immaculately clean. Yep. Nice. It had a great reputation. Yeah. He had great customers. Not that the other places didn't have good reputations, but it's just, you know, he, he was more homegrown and just more, you know, it, well, um, we kept the name. It's not a your cleaner. So we really thought that there was, it's been there. He bought it from the original owner and it's been in that location under that name since 1960. So, What's you know, I, I, that location. I, Valtone cleaners. Valtone. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and so there was so much value in that brand. Yeah. Um, that, that you yeah. Could, you, it didn't That's make the sense only one we it. didn't change. Sure. You know, we're generally pretty big that, you know, once you're part of the family, so to speak, everything changes the yeah. computer system, the logos, the signs, and we usually do it pretty quickly. Yeah. But, but that one, we kind of felt there was a lot of value around it. You know, at some point we may change it to make yeah. it easier going forward now. But we didn't want to. We didn't want to blow up anything by mistake, right? Uh, and then I think, um, and that was actually the store that we got introduced to. Now we are officially a dry cleaner because before that time we were wholesaling our dry cleaning business. Oh, yeah. We okay. just did our laundry and shirts ourselves. Yeah. And, okay. And because it was such things. a smaller amount, but then we really started seeing a need with the Eastgate store. We're like, mm, yeah, that, that wholesale bill that we're paying each, you know, week or whatever is getting bigger and bigger. So this is where you split from having just one plant that did the shirt service to now having two plants, one that does the dry cleaning and one that does the shirt service. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and probably I think maybe where Dave's going just to clarify. So a lot of people think you bring stuff to the dry cleaner, everything's dry clean. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we follow the labels on the clothes. So certain things like suits and dresses and silks go into a dry cleaning process. Traditionally, it used this fairly harsh chemical called perk. We upgraded to, you know, eco-friendly stuff a few years ago. Um, and it, it goes into a, a, a cleansing bath. It's kind of like a big washing machine and dryer together because it gets okay. cleaned and dried in the same machine. Uh, but it doesn't use water. So things like wools and such that can't be in waters get cleaned in this process. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the things that people wear today, uh, you know, are indeed washed, even yeah. if you're still pressing it or, you know, we have form finishers and, and other tools that finish the clothes. I just want to um, clarify one thing. When people bring anything into our shop, no matter what it is, if it's blue jeans or dockers, they want it dry clean. It's not until somebody says, I want my jeans starched and washed, washed and starched because they want them really stiff. So mm -hmm. we don't wash anything except for men's shirts, women's blouses yeah, and the button polos. down. Yeah. No, we don't wash polos. We dry clean everything. And the reason people bring it in to be dry clean versus wash, they, because they can do that at home. Um, is that they feel, and I feel also that you will, you know, your dyes, you know, things start to fade. Um, and especially gals who are spending 150 bucks on their dark, dark blue jeans. So you're going to keep that. And so they do, I learned that very early on because we did, we were reading labels, you know, maybe trying to cut that wholesale dry cleaning bill down. But I learned very early on, people are bringing it in. They want them unless they tell you they are assuming and they want them dry cleaned. Mm -hmm. So we're really big on that. So if mm -hmm. we're going to do something other than that, um, I'll let the customer know as well. You've got mud on these dockers. We need to wash them to get them. Okay. Clean. Oh, that's okay. So but, your um, plant, so your plant in your first store, I'm just make sure I understand this correctly. Yeah. So your plant in your first store was a laundry service, but you had pressing machines. Is that, yeah. am I using the right terminology? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there are, there are these machines for shirts that press the front and back simultaneously. It's like these big clamshell irons and it pulls the sleeves out and blows hot air through it to get rid of all the wrinkles. Yeah. And then there are big hothead presses that, you know, you can manually press things on. And so, so it's probably, you know, when we wash things, they probably don't get washed incredibly differently from at your laundromat. The big differentiator is we do a lot of pressing. Sure. Yeah. More of the finishing process. Is that a yeah. good way of saying it? Yeah. Yeah. Like shirts generally don't get dried. They go onto these machines wet and they get dried as part of the pressing mm -hmm. 
process, right? And that's yeah. how you get that nice finished pressed yeah, yeah. look. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Same with, you know, if you were to wash pants, they go on to these pants toppers and presses and and you're kind of pressing and tensioning the fabrics so that it gets laid out properly all the at the same time versus like I wash it, then I dry it, then I go press it. Because once it's gotten dry, it's really hard to get all those tiny little wrinkles out. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's where <laughs> We learn doing it through the process of it stays wet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That is shirts. Dry cleaning. Mm-hmm. You just want to make sure you pull it just like we do at home. Make sure you take it out right away and hang it up somehow, whether you're draping it over or hanging it up. And if you've ever, that's why it takes so much more labor to press a shirt than it does dry cleaning because your dry cleaners as Rich was saying earlier, they work several hours a day. I mean, they go through, they, they press so much faster, you know, it's, I don't know if it's the, the fabric or the nature of the fabric or what it is, but yeah, when it comes to cotton shirts, you know, it's, it's a much more okay. difficult garment. Yeah. And it hits several machines. So when it comes out, we say it stays wet, but then it goes to this machine called the cuff and collar machine. And so it, it basically is a hard press on the, the collar and on the cuffs, then it goes on the shirt machine that does the rest of it. So it, you know, not only is there the labor of it, but it, it hits several machines yeah. Yeah. in the, in several the process. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to kind of get that, like you say, that crisp shirt that looks pretty good. So, and then probably last year, right before the pandemic, we, we acquired two stores from um, a larger uh, group around here, um, uh, and one of them was physically like 500 feet away from one of our other stores. So it was a no brainer to put those two together. Sure. Right. Uh, and then, so in that case, are you just acquiring the customer base or what are yeah, you Yeah, basically? Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we closed on the thing at, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. And by three in the afternoon, we had everything moved into our store. Okay. I mean, we're kind of the rip the bandaid off kind of guys. Sure. Um, yeah. So it was, it was all about the customers, Dave. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it basically with a similar amount of labor, we, you know, more than doubled the business at that location. And, yeah. you know, now the downside is right. Then you kind of got to go deal with, there was a lease on the other location and you got to get out of that and got to go, you know, we've gotten good at disassembling and cleaning up after other people. So you did acquire the business as yeah. a whole. You took yeah, the so, yeah, customer here. base, moved yeah, them we over bought to your the business facility. As a whole. The things I think we've gotten better at is we've probably gotten um, a little more rigorous in what we think the value is. Meaning, you know, a lot of times you have to have a, to your point, Dave, on having you know, for entrepreneurs, you go have a discussion with someone about buying their business. The difficult thing is you're talking to someone who this is their pride and joy mm-hmm. and you have to have a discussion <laughs> to tell them their baby's ugly. So who do you think she looks like? Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> what? Lyndon Johnson? He's joking. No, I'm not joking. She looks like Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> right? And, exactly right. And, you know, they, they can go from getting mad to thinking you're being a jerk. And, you know, that's why we tend to focus on the financials is that's going to tell you the story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had some uh, early on, we looked at one in Hyde Park, which is a nice neighborhood here in Cincinnati. There are a number of cleaners there and we thought, well, oh, this could be great. And, you know, we met with these guys and after probably 15 minutes, I said, you know, between your rent and your uh, staffing, you're paying more than your your incoming revenue. Yeah. Before you do any production or pay for utilities, you guys are. I bet you guys are losing. You know, two three grand a month at this location, and I get this blank stare. Like, how did they you had no that idea? Out? They had no idea. No, because they had it merged in with other stuff they were doing. Yeah. And you know, so so, it, that's probably the thing that I would say is we've done this over time. We've probably gotten um, more critical on what's really the value and and well what's kind of interesting about that is we know what we want to buy we have presses we have you know every everything we need you know pretty much 
I'm like, do you have bodies? I'll take that. But um, <laughs> yeah, good, good people. I, you know what? I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic point, Teresa, because, you know, we, some of our best people we have acquired through acquiring businesses, not all, but some of them. And let's, you know, I'm not suggesting that humans are a commodity or anything insane. Like I'm not, not going down there. What I'm saying is I see, I see much more, you know, we all know <laughs> right now it's mid 2021. We are in a labor crisis, like not too many times in history. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is even when you're not in the middle of a labor crisis, the strength of your team is an incredible, what I call a market differentiator. And it doesn't matter how we find good people. We just have to find them if we yeah. want to be successful. And there's many arts to doing that. And this yeah. is one of them is what you're saying. When you're acquiring an existing business, maybe you are going to rip the equipment out. Maybe you are going to get out of the lease and not uh, focus on that location. You're going to merge things over. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You're looking at this and saying, do you have any good people? Because the <laughs> well, way your eyes lit up when you said that are the ways my eyes would light up, by the way, is right, because right. you see so much value in those people. You can, absolutely. But actually, I always kind of like halfway joke about this, but it's very surprising if I ask somebody what their number one asset is and they're looking around the place thinking, well, that press is worth about 10,000, I think. And, and, and I'm thinking, your customers, yeah. your customers. Yeah, number one customers, number, customers, number two employees. Yeah, yes. number one, number one asset is. And so a lot of times nowadays we have what we need. Um, we could take more customers, of course, more employees. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, it's kind of like a lot of times what we're looking at is we're looking at customer base. Do you have a customer list? Because we're interested in buying that. It's not lost on me that you all have built an amazing team your operations and your team um, and the management structure, you know, which is obviously led by you all. It's not lost on me that you see value in those things. So I just want to point out for our audience and our viewers, um, you know, one of the most difficult things in small business is finding and building an amazing team. And it is a differentiator, like probably no other. Um, at least that's my opinion. And so, you know, we, what I always tell people when I'm coaching with them and things like that is, well, yeah, you know, what's the answer to how do I find good people? The answer is yes. That's the answer. <laughs> Anywhere you can find good people. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. this is, a, I think this is a great uh, conversation as to the value of your team and how to build that. And there's many ways to do it. You can recruit people and teach them the skill sets if they have the character traits that we're looking for. But you can also acquire a competitor or a rival business and bring their team members on and know, okay, there's a certain amount of value associated with these people. Absolutely. Um, do you guys, and I'm not asking for numbers, but do you, do you calculate it that into your value when you're drilling down on the numbers as to their team is strong or not strong and we're going to inherit those people? Does it at least, I mean, is it, I'm sure it's in the back of your mind, but is it part of your quote unquote formula for I, uh, paying for a business? The tough part about that, Dave is you don't know until you've started working. Uh, they usually people. keep us pretty isolated. Yeah. So, so I think maybe notionally, like we'll get an idea of how many people. Yeah, we don't. And, and you may occasionally say, oh, I've heard something about somebody at another place if they're close by. Mm -hmm. But we're pretty blind, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when, when we go in there on the people. We've gone in places and our expectation of what we think people should be doing and what they may have been held accountable to before is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I, I, the one that still sticks in my mind is we took over one place and one of these guys came in and he colored in a coloring book. Well, yeah. Well, you don't yeah. pay people to color. We do all the time. Right. Our business right. doesn't pay people to color. Right. So <laughs> Dave, you kind of touched on this earlier as far as coming from a corporate background. And um, my background is uh, very, very labor aware, very labor. -aware. I mean, can you imagine doing the payroll at Kroger? No. So, yeah. So, I mean, we like every half an hour every 15 minutes. I mean, you're and all these people are unionized when I was in the stores. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, very expensive labor. So I was constantly either cutting, adding, cutting, adding, you know, you don't want lines, but then you don't want people standing around. And so I, I'm always aware. I mean, it's just been so drilled into me to always watch labor. And that's what I think people are like, I'm like, sort hangers, you know, back in the front end, something, do something, you know? So 
So it sounds like that skill set that was drilled in you through your years at, at Kroger Absolutely. was a pretty natural transition into another labor intensive business. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm amazed because, you know, my exposure around, you know, labor was more in a factory and manufacturing environment. So for me, the kind of looking at a process and production and cost of materials and what takes time, like I can get that, but I, I don't have, you know, for what, it's not as natural for me as it is for Teresa. She's just naturally like a hawk about that stuff. And, you know, it's not that look, we're happy to pay people when they're doing great work, but, you know, overstaffing is just kind of silly. Yeah, sure. You know, it's not a charity. Yeah. Um, and well, it'll, it'll catch up. Because there's no margin in this business, as you know. Right. Very, oh, very slim. Yeah. Yeah, it'll catch up with you. Yeah. Actually, can we yeah. kind of talk about that? Because I know the dry cleaning business was hit horribly hard during the pandemic. They weren't wearing their suits. They weren't, you know, yeah. wearing their dressy clothes to church. They were doing everything from home. So dry cleaning was hit hard. How did you all manage to survive? Um, everybody except for Sammy and I were laid off. I, I, I quit taking pay as well. So for six wow. weeks, we basically ran the company with just Sammy as a salaried person. Our, our manager of the main okay. plant. Yeah. Sammy is your okay. manager. Okay. Yeah, yeah, our manager. Um, so um, I condensed the route to two days versus four. And on the other two days, I or three days, because we're all closed on Sunday, I opened um, a store for four hours and then I would leave and I would go close a store for four hours. And Sammy did that every day. And he did the dry cleaning and the laundry and he opened a store and he closed a store. So we kept four stores open. It was minimal hours, but didn't need it anyway. So we did that for six weeks. So, I mean, we actually made good money. You know what I mean? Even though the volume was very low. How severe was the drop in revenue with COVID? Oh, 80%? It, it, yeah, it probably in the beginning, yeah, it was even it, more it, than yeah. 80. It was probably, you know. It, it was it, like a light switch got flipped off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, it, did that 80% last for, I mean, we're now pushing a year and a half into COVID. Was it, a, I mean, 60, 40? Like, did it trickle back or was there kind of more of like a, you were at 80% down for 6, 8, 12 months and then as people got vaccinated and started to open back up, how, what was the process of, of so, losing so like that said, revenue? We did that for six weeks and we could tell when it, you know, we, we were clicking along and doing, you know, two people running four stores and Sammy did all the production and I ran the route. So that, that's a lot. Um, we could tell when things were starting to open back up because there was, everything was shut down. So we brought back like two or three people after six weeks Okay. and then kind of gradually brought people back, just kind of like ramping the employees back up as the volume came back. Um, by the end of summer, we brought back. Um, so when COVID, before COVID, we had approximately 21 to 23 employees and um, then went down to just Sammy and I. And then um, after six weeks, we were probably at five employees. And by the end of the summer, we were at, I'd say, eight. And by Christmas time, we were up to 10 and we're holding at 10. Okay. We've been holding at 10. Yeah, I've never gone beyond that. Ten. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I hired somebody. So we're at 11. So you all yeah. still haven't reached pre-COVID levels as far as your business? No, I think we were kind of hovering at about 50% for a long time. And then now, you know, the it, it has picked up the past couple months. Yeah. But yeah. we're still probably off a good 30 some percent. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, the other thing we we probably did too is before we had more people with maybe less hours for some of the people. Yeah. And yeah. And in this process, the kind of keep our core people we wanted to keep satisfied, right? we we've kind of run some overtime and we're keeping them pretty pretty full time. Yeah, pretty much. And I, I'm a big believer in um, leaving people at locations so that they get to know customers and vice versa. Sure. Um, and so if a store is open nine to six, that employee works nine to six. And before we would have, you know, because that's our hours now, we do have reduced hours right now. Um, before we would have somebody open the store and somebody close the store. So 
Um, because as we all know, people were making good money on unemployment. So the people who came back kind of wanted it to be worth their while, or they'd rather stay at home. So yeah. kind of why we took that path. And that's pretty much everybody's been happy with that path. So, you know, I think we tried to really focus on our key folks. Oh, and, definitely. And, definitely. Uh, you want to keep sure those good people. We probably got pushed down the path of doing some things in COVID that, you know, faster than we would have, or things we never would have thought of. But I think the outcome was, you know, we're now in an okay position. Of course, do we want to have more revenue back? For sure. Yeah. And to <laughs> Teresa's point, we want to get some more quality people on the team. Yeah, it's kind of hard to find them. Uh, but, you know, I think that'll come with time. Yeah. Sure. Well, I think the the big differentiator with you all versus a lot of the other dry cleaners who have struggled through COVID and not survived is that quick reaction time you all had. And probably your your background in corporate America. I mean, you could analyze things and kind of do the whole cost benefit analysis to things and, and find a new strategy. And that worked well for you. I know Dave talks all the time about what a good job you all do. Just you're very consistent, your product's consistent, you're very reliable. If you all say you're gonna be there to pick up at a certain time, you're there and so on. Um, what are some of the processes you use or would recommend to other dry cleaners to get such a consistent product? Do you have any advice there? So first of all, thank you, Dave, very much. And we <laughs> echo you. that as far as everything you do for us. So thank you. And back to the employee, a lot of that kudos to Sammy, the manager, and he he handles your account with kid gloves. And, you know, so that's all Sammy, really. Um, but as far as that goes, I'm a big process and procedure person. So, you know, I think, you know, not just maybe putting a post-it note on the screen and saying, you guys, you know, don't forget we tagged the shirts this way or whatever. I think that, you know, having things posted mm -hmm. and then, you know, I was always told inspect what you expect. So I, you know, going behind people and, and once they know you're going to come behind and follow up and check it out. Um, it, it just become, then it becomes second nature, any habit that they had before. Now this is their habit. So right. I just think doing things the same way over and over and kind of like Richard said earlier about the stores are the same. You can take an employee to any one of the stores. It's the same computer. It's the same tagging process. It's the same sorting process. Everything's the same. So, you know, it, it should be everything the same. So, right. yeah. Very repeatable processes. I mean, mar cuts the margin of error down, right? Exactly. Yep. I mean, that just, that almost falls under the common sense category, but right. it seems like a lot of small businesses that have multiple locations and some that even don't have, that just have one location. Yeah. They don't seem to understand that for some reason. Right. You, you know, functionally, the tasks that need to get done, I think Teresa's has done a good job of documenting what those are, you know, the, whether they're following certain color tags, whether we know that every day you're supposed to have this done, you know, there's a closing procedure for the store. There's an opening procedure, right? That that stuff's all written so that, you know, right. when you train someone, there's a reference guide, mm -hmm. right? That they can look at and go down, okay, I, you know, I did all of these things. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, kind of along those lines, when you talk about, you know, other folks, probably one of the things I think we, we probably got a little, maybe because we hadn't been in the business is... Um, you were probably always looking for other things the employees can be doing if they have downtime, yeah. right? So because, you know, one of our locations is where the production is, you can be in a drop store and you may have gaps of not having customers coming in. And so, you know, we do some things a little bit differently. We do all our, our assembly, meaning putting the, the hangered items together and put a bag on it and tag. We do that at the drop store because you're already paying to have someone there for as long as the store is open they generally can fit that into their day mm -hmm. where some folks go, Oh, I do all that stuff in the plant. Now you've employed another person to go do that when somebody may have downtime elsewhere. You know, sometimes we have people address and send out postcards and other promotional things. Uh, sometimes we've had them done data entry. So it, it, it you know, one of our locations, the seamstress also is the person at the store. So, you know, when it gets really busy, then we have to double up. But, you know, when it's been slower, that's actually been pretty good for us. Yeah. Well, I think I think you've hit, you know, we've hit on a bunch of things that really can be the difference in a successful small business or even a big business for that matter. 
um, yeah. and not. But I think the biggest one that I'm hearing over and over again that we we couldn't agree with more is just finding that excess capacity, whether it's in your labor or your equipment or your rent or whatever. Um, you know, when we started our pickup and delivery business, that was the mindset. That was the macro of why we wanted to go down that road is I was like, we've invested all this money in equipment. And all I kept thinking was if we start a pickup and delivery business and can what I call extend our front door out into the community throughout Cincinnati, which you've done with your delivery service too. If we can do those things, all I knew is, okay, yeah, labor will go up, utilities will go up, but they'll be proportionate. But I don't have to go buy a couple million dollars worth of equipment yeah. or even a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. My rent doesn't double. No. But my sales could double. And it just, like, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I can do basic basic addition and subtraction. <laughs> And so it just made all the sense of the world to me. Um, and uh, and that's what that's why we've done what we've done. And it's good to hear that it's worked for you all as well. You built a pretty amazing business um, in a fairly short period of time. Um, and you've done it in one of the most trying times um, in history. And there weren't too many businesses took a hit like a dry cleaning industry has and is really continuing to. And yeah. you guys have weathered that. And what I'm hearing is that your business in a lot of ways, while you're not certainly not back yet where you want to be, you're probably better positioned for the future than just about any dry cleaner that, that that is out there um, because you've taken those, you've taken those hits, you've weathered that storm. And eventually people are going to go back to having weddings. It's already happening in their events yeah. and they're going to go back to the office and maybe not everybody, but a lot of people will. A lot so, of people. Yeah. So one of the questions I have for you is big picture. If you look back to the to the five and a half years you've been doing this, um, what's the what's the biggest challenge that you've run into? I, you know, the the ongoing challenge of labor, you know, is is always top of mind for me. You know, because even once you get somebody, you know, hired and trained, I was thinking about this today. Is um, it takes quite a while for a shirt presser to be really good and proficient. So. That position is quite an art. Is that a fair It really assessment? is. Because I've come to yeah. your plant once, you know, years back. I've come to your plant and observed it, and I was like a deer in the headlights as to the art that is watching these people do their craft. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I think probably one of the things, uh, you know, that I think we generally try to look at it is if you let the stuff become overwhelming, then you can kind of freeze up, right? But you just kind of keep taking a bite at it. Yeah. You know, How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? <laughs> yep. And and I think, you know, I, I I think we've tried to, you know, when we first started, I think equipment issues were maybe a bigger issue yeah. for us than yeah. they were today. And over time, we made investments there and, you know, been proactive about repairing things and making sure that, you know, you've got some backups and, mm -hmm. and so it's not so single threaded. Uh, but for sure, you know, the employee situation is kind of on you every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the other thing that helps with that, Dave, especially when you're someone new coming to the market, and I, I know you've commented about this before, is having good relationships with your partners and your suppliers. Sure. And, you know, I think one of the things we've been fortunate is, um, you know, it took us some trial and error, but, you know, we've got some, you know, some decent partners that help us with things. So some's on the equipment side. I, I think of, you know, in addition to our in-house seamstress, we've got some people that help us with that. You know, we got a great partner that does leathers and, and furs and so forth. So you don't have to do everything yourself. And I think if you treat these guys well, then, you know, they're willing to help you out too. Right. There's a lot of great people that are really smart that I think we've, been fortunate to get some help from from time to time yeah and and uh we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier but you know coming not coming from the industry is has always i think been a benefit for us because a lot of people in the industry have their story of back in the day you know this store did a half a million a year and this store did 1.3 million a year and this store is like you know, a lot of those numbers don't exist anymore. Right. <laughs> and it's not 1985. And, anymore, and guys. they haven't adjusted their labor. They're still paying the higher rent. They, you know, so those things to us, like we came in and the business wasn't super great in 2015. It, it had already started to decline and it's just really trickled down since then. So, I mean, we kind of came into it being lean and we just stayed that way. 
probably if they're as harsh as it sounds, if there's a good thing that, you know, COVID has done is it's thinned out, it's, it's thinned out some of the people, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we had a, and, and I would say we've actually acquired business because of that, of course. I mean, so when, you mean when like, COVID first started, my thought was from day one is this is going to be a uh, survival of the fittest. Yes. And y'all have proven you're the fittest. Yeah. <laughs> Not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what you mean, though, is so like, basically, we've had COVID's kind of forced a leveling out of supply and demand, where there was yeah. too much supply of dry cleaners, the demand has been going down. And now it's kind of yeah. evening up again. Yeah, because the, the sad thing is, you know, we ran into guys that had, you know, irrational pricing, mm -hmm. you know, they, they didn't get very good quality, but they were cheap, right? They would do anything. And you know, there are some people who just think that that's, you know, price is a factor, but I, probably the one thing we have come to learn that is for the most part, most of our customers aren't very price focused. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, we've, we've done price increases and we don't have a lot of pushback. So it's not like you're driving around looking for the cheapest gas yeah. or, you know, for the dollar menu at McDonald's because I can get a burger and a, and a drink for a buck, mm -hmm. right? It's a convenience business and especially in the home delivery. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, yeah. that's, you get into the habit. So, you know, I think, you know, kind of in the big, some of the big picture stuff, Dave, I, I think that, you know, don't be afraid to price for what you think your stuff's worth and don't be, um, don't undersell yourselves. Yeah, I'm not saying you can be, you know, unreasonable, but, you know, you need to believe in the product you're delivering and that it's worth something. And, and, you know, what we've seen is some of these guys who didn't believe in pricing appropriately, right? They, their business couldn't stand. And COVID was the thing that kind of gave them the push. Yeah. High volume is their key to success. They needed right. that volume. And once that was gone, it's like, you, you don't have anything. Cause like yeah. you said, there's no margin here. Right. Well, in an industry that has been, declining as an industry for yes. you guys correct me but would 30 to 40 years be out of yeah it pro well probably a good 20, any, 20 anyway right okay. they, they kind of say the casual fridays was the thing that mm, okay. you know all First of a sudden nail in the 20 percent of your <laughs> formal wear went away right for your average right. for the work person that right? makes sense yeah right and so and that, that was probably the 90s right 20, yeah right a good yeah. 20 years right mm -hmm. and so you know i uh you know i think Every business can be a, a decent business, uh, you know, as long as you have the right balance of supply and demand. You know, right now, I think we're still suffering a little bit of overcapacity. Hold on. Here's a book that Rich has at his desk, always has. Oh, what is this? Every business is a growth business. Oh, nice. Who's the author of that? I don't think uh, we can read that. I believe it is uh, Ram Sharan. Ram Sharan. And, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And, um, and so... You know, the basic thing, it, 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 you know, some of it's a little business schooly, but most of it's really good. And, you know, it talks about like, um, you know, a furniture store, right? And uh, one of the examples they talk about is sometimes in business, everybody's looking for the home run, right? Oh, this has got to scale. It's got to move the needle. And, you know, but if you're just using baseball analogies, focus on, you know, singles and doubles and you keep doing that consistently you can grow your business. So yeah, I mean, when we've done acquisitions, so that's a little bit of the home run because you get a big injection of, of growth. But you know, when you sign up a new root customer or you get a customer who does a referral or another place closes and a new person comes through the door, every one of those is just a single or a double that helps you grow your business. Since it's lots of little pieces, there's usually no silver bullet. You know, everybody always wants to ask when somebody did something. We're not saying, you know, we're one of these great success stories, but everybody goes, how'd you do it? Because mm -hmm. everybody's wanting to hear that silver bullet. Like, if I only do this, Dave, I can, <laughs> you know, I can replicate Apple's success. Right. Well, you know, there's no one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the thing that we've kind of learned is you kind of chug along and you have to kind of consistently do these things. And a customer's happy they tell someone else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes people that go away then come back and, you know, you just kind of keep taking care of customers and building. Yeah. At, at Kroger, um, they would always stress upon us that, I mean, they 
can spend so much money on acquisition, you know, commercials, all kinds of advertising and whatnot. But really the key is keeping who you've got first. Yeah. Yeah. Keep who you've got first, you know, before you start going out there and forgetting about, uh, you know, who, who's coming in the store and going after the pie in the sky. I want that Walmart customer. So, you know. It's a lot cheaper to keep the person that's already absolutely, coming. Absolutely, absolutely. That's somebody who has That's right. That's, it's, <laughs> well, it's so much cheaper. Yeah. And that end, it costs you nothing as long as you're doing the right job. You know, exactly. Right. Uh, Tree said this you know, example, it happened to us fairly early on when we added a, a store, the guy you bought the suit for. Oh, yeah, yeah. Somebody had actually, somebody had washed his pants and it was a $1,200. Meaning suit. somebody on our team, we yeah. made a mistake. Yeah, and I was just like stressing about it going, oh, oh, $1,200. I hadn't paid out that before. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> to this day, one of our top customers, and he even said it to me, he said, you'll have a customer for life. So, yeah. you know, less everybody more. makes mistakes. It's how you handle the mistakes. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. And I think, Absolutely. I think sometimes, you know, especially in a small business, a lot of people look at the money going out and they're worried about, Oh, you know, somehow this customer's trying to screw me. And it's like, you know, in the scheme of things, okay, someone may slip something by you, but you know, I would say pretty much everyone, when we've taken care of something, yeah, we've always been paid back many times over because yeah. they've been yeah. loyal. They've said good things to other pers- other people, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's a hard thing. You know, a friend of mine used to say, your idea of how much something costs depends on which side of the check you're signing. So if you're mm-hmm. the one writing it, right, you've got a much bigger appreciation than if you're the one that just endorses the back to cash it. Yeah. And, and so I think in a small business, the idea of paying something out you know, you almost feel like you're giving something up and, and that can be hard. But I think our experience has been when you've taken care of people, generally get paid back many times over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One of my mentors early on uh, shared a story with me with it. His dad shared with him, which was kind of his mentor, um, which is our equipment distributor, HM company here in Cincinnati. Um, And his dad told him early on in his career that if you just focus on serving people and treating them the way that you would want to be treated, the money will follow. The money's just a way of keeping score is what was the ultimate quote that his dad told him. Um, and they focused on that. They've built an amazing business over many generations now, uh, many decades, couple of generations. Um, I've taken that to heart and that's a big part of what's made us successful. I've tried to build a team of people that believe that so that I don't have to browbeat it into them. They just, that's who they are as an individual. That's yeah. one of their character traits. And I know that you all have done something very similar with your businesses, which is which is why you're not only successful in an industry that is otherwise declining, but you've been successful at a probably an unprecedented time um, in history for any business, but especially for, for the dry cleaning industry. And here you are in a perfect, in my opinion, in an ideal position to thrive moving forward as we come out of this. Um, that's at least my observation. I'm not doing your books, but hey, we're gonna we're praying for you if nothing else, You're right? Strong, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, thank you so much for sharing um, your journey. Um, I think there's an insane amount of information and knowledge uh, and education in here for our audience, uh, whether you're in the dry cleaning or laundromat industry or not. Um, if you're in business for yourself and you can't pick 10 or 15 good golden nuggets out of this interview, uh, then you're not paying attention. You need to rewind it and watch it again and take better notes the second time around. So we appreciate you guys uh, taking time out of your busy life to do this with us. Well, listen, my so friends. Before we close, though, we need to let you give a final plug. Yes. Um, where are your stores located for people that want to go and check you out? How can people reach you possibly if they want advice on dry cleaning or starting a business in dry cleaning? Okay. Well, uh, so we're located here in Cincinnati. We have uh, stores in the uh, Eastgate, Mount Carmel area, in Milford, uh, in Loveland, and um, uh, in uh, the Kemper Montgomery Road area. And we do home delivery all around the east side. So you can go to our website at yourcleanerscincy.com. Uh, and you can contact us through the website. There's a little, you know, contact us and it goes right to Teresa. And, you know, if people have questions, uh, you know, we'll be glad to answer them. And if, you know, you need stuff dry, cleaned or washed, why we'd be happy to do that as well. 
Yes, I can vouch. They do a fabulous job. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I probably should have said this at the beginning of the the, uh, the episode, but if our audience hasn't figured out the obvious, we offer through our pickup and delivery service here at Cincinnati Happy Nest, we offer dry cleaning. We don't do dry cleaning because I'm not anywhere near smart enough to run that kind of a <laughs> Way business. Too complicated. Um, but what we were very lucky several years ago to find uh, Rich and Teresa, um, and they we have partnered with them. We are one of their wholesale customers, um, and we are we are actively growing our business um, with with the relationship that we have with them. So. Uh, if you haven't figured all that out, we have a relationship already, and they're amazing partners. Um, and as they talked about earlier in the industry, a big part of the key to small business success is building a team. A lot of people assume that just means their internal team, their employees, and that's true. But there's an there's an absolute ton of value out there in looking at your distributor, your attorney, your dry cleaning wholesale company, uh, your CPA, um, your mentors, whatever, you know, I could go on forever about the value associated with those relationships. But the thing I want to leave people with today is if you want to have those kind of golden relationships in your business, both internally in your team and externally with your accountant and your dry cleaner, you need to be the type of person that you want them to be for you. This is a win-win proposition. So you can't just expect things of other things that you're not, that of other people that you're not willing to give yourself. Um, exactly. So hopefully that'll be like number 386 golden nugget for this interview. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for joining us thanks, today. Guys. We'll see you everybody next time um, on Laundromat Millionaire Business Podcast. Take care. Thank Bye. you.